So welcome to this week's installment of uh, Grasp on Robotics. It's a great pleasure to have Professor Radhika Nagpal here. So um, Radhika is a professor in uh, computer science and mechanical and aerospace engineering at Princeton University. I'm sure um, everyone uh, knows about her, all her cool stuff. Um, she is the recipient of a Microsoft New Faculty Fellowship, Career Awards, Anita Borg Early Career Award, Radcliffe Fellowship. She has been invited to give um, TED Talks. She is, um, you know, one of the Nature Awards. So she got one of these that is given to the top 10 most influential scientists and engineers, right? Um, and in addition to that, she still has the time to be able to um, you know, establish Rootboat Robotics, which is an educational robotics company aimed to democratize things like AI, robots, um, and just STEM in general. Um, and then of course it's been, it was acquired by iRobot. Um, I don't know how she has all the time. Um, and then, she, you know, so she has done so much in support um, of uh, young faculty, postdocs, graduate students uh, during her entire career. She is one of my favorite roboticists, a wonderful oh. role model. And it is, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today. So whenever you're ready, Radhika, we look forward to your talk towards collective AI. So please give her a very, very warm welcome. Thank you. Yeah, it's really, it's really nice to be back at UPenn. Um, there's so much work here that was really inspiring to me. And also I came here uh, as one of my first early talks as a, as a junior faculty member. And at that time, the only robots I had uh, were Lego robots. <laughs> and I thought that at that point, all of the roboticists here would look the other way and pretend like I didn't exist. But on the contrary, they were really excited uh, to welcome me in the field. And I think today, I think, is a little different story. I have so many robots that I'm losing track of them. Um, so I think it just goes to show you never really know when you're starting out uh, what your life will look like many, many years later. So um, the topic that I'm really interested in is collective intelligence. So how is it that large numbers of, uh, large numbers of agents with very simple interaction rules can cooperate to achieve really complex behavior. Um, so oops, now I have to fight. Yes. Um, yeah, so, so how does collective intelligence emerge? So uh, as a computer scientist and a roboticist, uh, I study this topic. Um, and I study this topic in many ways. So this is actually, this is me on my 45th birthday, trekking about 10 miles a day, 100% humidity, 90 degrees uh, weather, uh, searching for army ants. And army ants are this really spectacular example of collective intelligence. So there are millions of these ants uh, work together. They create, they um, forage over large regions. They even create bridges and entire uh, structures out of their own bodies. And we barely understand how this is possible, even though there's no leader in charge. Uh, so you can think of, of course, ants as a classic example of collective intelligence, but you could also think of cells as being a form of collective intelligence. So large numbers of cells with identical DNA form complex structures from fruit flies to, to starfish and to ourselves. And there's amazing abilities to regenerate. So starfish, for example, can regenerate a limb. So it's an amazing concept that you can get this from collective intelligence. Collective intelligence can operate at much larger scales than cells. So these are termite mounds that can be as high as uh, two to 10 meters high. And they're built by tiny little insects that are just centimeter scale that are cooperating to create this immense structure. Um, you can also think of collective intelligence uh, with larger organisms. So if you think of fish schools or bird flocks, we see all of these dynamic formations uh, that all seem to arise from these large groups of individuals. So I think um, to all of us, um, to most people, these systems are really, really fascinating to watch and fascinating to observe. And I think one of the reasons we find them so fascinating is that 
the size of the individual that is taking part in this is so tiny compared to the phenomena that they are part of, which is so large. And it just seems mind boggling that any one element or any one agent in this system can coordinate with others um, or even know what's going on at the other side of the swarm. So how is it that this coordination can, can emerge when there's such a different size scale? But it does emerge and it emerges, in fact, really, really well. So much so that after a while you forget that there is an individual agent at all. And instead you start to think of the whole collective almost as if it is itself a single agent. And we can reason about that agent. And that idea that collective autonomy uh, can emerge from individuals that are just interacting uh, seems, seems really remarkable. Um, so I think the phenomena itself you know, seems remarkable. And then I think as you look deeper, the algorithms that biologists think are in play are also pretty remarkable. So we believe that there are in these systems no real leaders involved, um, no individuals telling the group what to do or, or organizing who should do what or beware. Um, but instead, all of this is emerging from interaction rules. So individuals interacting with their neighbors and then somehow everyone doing the same rule the system is self-organizing. So the, the ability of self-organization to demonstrate a kind of intelligence, uh, I think makes these systems also super fascinating. So of course, if you're a biologist, then your goal is to understand this intelligence. How is it that this kind of collective intelligence emerges? Um, but if you're an engineer, of course, your first instinct is how do I get my own? <laughs> so if we could understand uh, the basis of this natural intelligence, would we be able to create artificial systems based on these same principles? Um, and what would that take to create these artificial collectives? And I think there are lots of reasons why we might want to do that. So if you think of robotics, um, there's almost no application of robotics where we're going to just put one robot in this space. We're always going to want to put multiple robots in this space, whether you think of agriculture or environmental monitoring or disaster relief or you know, applications with satellites is always large numbers of robots. And if we think of a future where we have self-driving cars, then all of a sudden we have roads with millions of robots um, on, on the road. And so in these systems, we do want the systems to have good collective behavior. And in particular, we certainly don't want them to have bad behavior. So what are the programming techniques that we can use in order to achieve coherent behavior from multi-robot systems. So I think that's one, one reason to study collective behavior uh, or to study how it emerges uh, in, in nature. Um, for me, another reason maybe is more, uh, more of like a fundamental reason, like I'm fundamentally interested in how, how does complexity arise from simple agents? So for example, are there universal principles that you might see that exist in cells and ants and fish and humans and robots um, that just transcend scale? Are there just a few good ideas of how to self-organize systems? And we can use robotics as a way to emulate biology and to test the generality of these kinds of ideas. So there's also, I think, both an ap applied side to understanding collective intelligence, but also maybe a scientific motive for understanding collective intelligence through robotics. So that's what my group works on. We, um, we build robots. <laughs> Um, we look at systems in biology and biological collectives, and we build robots to try and emulate the kinds of things that um, we see in nature. And in emulating them with robotics, we're both trying to learn what are the kinds of rules and collective intelligence that, that leads to this uh, robust behavior or these tasks, but also what are the kind of robot morphologies? So what is the, what is the embodiment and mechanical intelligence that agents are leveraging as well. So both, both rules are things that we can learn, but also robot designs is something that we can learn from the system. And we work closely with biologists. We participate in a lot of biological studies, and we also uh, work on algorithms and theory. And so it's really through this interdisciplinary um, triangle of sorts uh, that we, we attack different problems in my lab. So um, today I was going to tell you uh, about a couple of projects from my lab that have to do with the same examples that I showed you in the first video. And what puts all of these three, these four examples, although I'll only talk about three, 
uh, these four examples on the same map is that these are all examples of collectives that are creating some kind of structure. Um, so cells are creating structure, army ants and termites are creating structure, uh, and fish are creating structure in motion. So I'll talk about examples of collectives that create structure and our attempt to create robots that emulate that structure. All right, so we start with cells. Um, so cells, of course, are, are an amazing and large area of study. Um, and they create amazing structures starting from identical DNA. So what is it that cells do in order to create these complex structures? So as a graduate student, I actually first learned about um, what, what's, how cells organize from this beautiful article that was written by Christian Nusslin Volhart. And she won the Nobel Prize in 1995 for her discovery of how cells organize. And she showed that, in certain, that there were certain cells in the system, which she called pole cells, that created chemical gradients through the system called morphogens. And so the idea was that these cells would create a chemical gradient through the system, and then other cells could use the strength of the chemical gradient to interpret their position. And uh, by measuring the strength of the gradient, figure out what part of the pattern they were. So it's sort of like creating a coordinate system on cells. And this allowed thousands of cells to reliably organize stripe-like patterns, like what you see in this, in this right-hand side, which is the fruit fly embryo, um, which then becomes the segmented body of the insect. So it's a precursor to creating form. Um, and it's really, um, she discovered and, and showed essentially how all these stripes form in the fruit fly body. And it was uh, really the first demonstration of how cells were creating pattern. So what if we could create our own active robotic cells uh, that did the same thing? So uh, thousands of robotic cells that could self-assemble uh, into a structure and programmed with identical rules to make the shape that you wanted. So a starfish, a fruit fly, maybe a wrench, <laughs> whatever it is that you need, and that all of this would occur through the local interactions of these many, many robotic cells. So uh, of course, this is what science fiction movies are made of. So Big Hero 6, the Millibots is just one example. Um, we're constantly imagining that we could do this in the future. Um, but it's also the futuristic goal that motivates the field of programmable matter within, ro within robotics. Um, and the goal there is to create tiny robotic modules, mass manufacture them in the thousands, and then program them to create versatile kinds of structures. And there's, of course, you know, a long history of looking at programmable materials and reconfigurable and modular robots um, here in, in UPenn. Um, so there's, I, I think maybe you guys are my more familiar audience than I usually have as to why somebody would want to do this crazy science fiction thing. So morphogen gradients were actually an idea that inspired many people in the programmable matter uh, field. There were lots of self-assembly algorithms that were designed and programming languages that were designed uh, with this concept. But to be honest, it took us another two decades before we could test those ideas uh, on really a thousand robot swarms. So not even the 4,000 cells that a fruit fly has, but just, just a thousand. And this was the Kilobot project in my lab uh, where the goal was to create the first uh, 1,024, but you know, 10 to the two, uh, three <laughs> robots uh, working together. All right, so this is just a video showing, uh, showing the kilobots. And that's uh, Mike Rubenstein, who led the kilobot project, now a faculty at Northwestern. And so here you can see the, all the, the thousands of robots together. And so each individual robot is a very minimalist robot. It can move forward, it can turn, and it communicates wirelessly with a very small number of robots around it. So just like two or three body lengths around. And so for the whole system to organize, the information has to travel through the whole swarm. So each one talks to each one, which then talks to somebody else. And those, so the whole, for the whole group to coordinate, we have to have these messages propagate through the system. All right, I usually make a joke that, you know, Mike is, Mike is himself self-assembled from cells and then he's making kilobots that self-assemble. <laughs> there just seems to be this constant self-assembly aspect to our lab. All right. So what can we do with kilobots? We can actually implement artificial gradients. So in this picture, you can kind of think of, we pick one, one robot as essentially the seed, 
and the seed robot creates a message that has a value, let's say 10. And as it propagates it to its neighbors, the neighbors decrement the value before they propagate it. And now we essentially create a gradient that is very similar to the idea of the chemical gradient in that it decreases with strength away from the pole. And by having multiple seeds and multiple overlapping gradients, we can basically start to create coordinate systems within the system and start to create these stripe-like patterns similar to the fruit fly. All right, so we can create art artificial morphogens. So how do you go now from artificial morphogens to artificial morphogenesis, where we're actually building many types of complex shape? And it turns out there are many different ways of doing this. Uh, so I'll talk about three different ways, two from my lab and one from, my, um, uh, from one of my colleagues' lab, Professor Sabine Hort, um, a technique that she looked at. And all of these three systems uh, exist in nature. Okay, so how do, we, how do we make form from pattern? So you can think of one way to do it is by growing the shapes. This is the leftmost one, the directed growth. So the idea is I start from a seed and I build a structure in layers. And you can think of this like a plant growing where you're creating one structure after the other. Um, and we can use gradients to essentially create these layers in the system. So that's one method. Another method is we can use gradients to create a coordinate system uh, form the pattern with the coordinate system, and then kill off all of the parts that we don't like. Um, so that's, a, that's a, a way in which, for example, the human hand is formed in that there are actually webs between the fingers, and then later on there's cell death between the fingers. So that's another way to create pattern. And here the seed is the part that maybe creates the first coordinate system. And then another technique that we can use is to actually create Turing patterns. So if we have two morphogens that are diffusing through the system, and reacting and uh, diffusing and reacting, then we can create patterns with a system like the spots of a leopard or the stripes of a, of a um, zebra. And then those spots and stripes can actually be centers of growth and start creating growth. So there's really many ways we can go and create artificial structures um, through, these, through these very simple idea of morphogens. So what does this look like when you run it on a large number of cells or run it on kilobots. Okay, so I'll just show videos of all three of these uh, processes. So this is a very, very sped up video uh, of some of our first uh, self-assembly experiments. And you have a thousand cells that are forming a starfish shape and you can see the layers forming one, uh, one over another. And of course we don't have cell division. So we actually have a pool of cells that are being siphoned off in order to create these layers. And what's important here is that even though this global shape is emerging, the internals are not quite as geometric as you might imagine. And also there's no global eye, so no cell knows where it's going to end up. It's really as part of the process um, forming into a shape. So we have errors and error correction and all sorts of other things going on, but we can basically grow a shape with kilobots. Okay, um, we can also do it through self disassembly. So here we have a sheet of kilobots um, and we have a seed in the center, which might be a little hard to see, but it's basically forming a pattern in the system. And then we use quorum sensing through the group so that the group decides when it's done enough pattern formation to move to the next phase. And of course here we can't quite kill off the, the robots. So we actually have a gradient of light. And so all of the robots move themselves off. And it's interesting just to contrast these two methods um, the first method, for example, took us about 13 hours, uh, and the second one took half an hour <laughs> um, and is actually substantially more precise. And so I think even as, uh, as technologists, we understand that some things are better to make uh, through removing materials, some things are better to make through additive process, but somehow I think even in, even in this world, we'll have to discover additive or subtractive and, and different kinds of, of methods. All right. And then the last video I'm showing is from my colleague, Sabine Hortz. So here you actually see um, the, the reaction diffusion equations running on kilobots and is starting to form spots. And then the spots actually attract robots to move there, which actually then changes the diffusion pattern. And so you see that even in this reaction diffusion method, we can create kind of limb structures. However, every time you run it, you get a different structure. So, um, it's harder to control, but it also has this amazing ability to self-repair. So you can actually cut off parts of it or rearrange the system 
and the system will start to grow and re rearrange itself. Yeah. I, I don't think it's known. And of course, there's even more. There's like deformation is another one. So for example, the embryo um, during neurogenesis basically creates the canal, but it basically deforms. So there's even more mechanisms. I don't think it's at all understood when, when evolution prefers which one. Um, yeah, I don't even know if they think of it that way, which is maybe more interesting. Like as engineers, we're like, which is the better method versus the question of like, this is what evolved, right? Not why is it better to evolve this one? It might be that it evolved because the previous organism had that method. Yeah, I, I think that even the question of whether Turing patterns uh, are involved in, in development is still sort of an open question. So, so James Sharp, who is Sabine's collaborator here, actually works on limb formation and they think that Turing patterns are involved even in our own digit formation, which is a very new concept. And so they were actually using kilobots to also explore that concept as well. Any other questions? All right. All right. So I think that um, you know we're obviously still pretty far from being able to do uh, what biology can do. But I think what's exciting to me is that we are starting to close that gap, moving from just thinking about self-organization to being able to embodiment, to, to consider embodies, uh, embodied intelligence. And there's so many different versions of this that we can imagine in the field. But as we move towards larger and larger numbers, I think we start to approach that point where you start to forget that there are cells at all. Uh, and you can really think of it as, as a collective entity. And I hope that as we continue, we'll be able to, to close that gap even further. All right, so um, the Kilobots project was really about uh, scale but it was still limited to 2D. So what if we wanted to assemble structures in three dimensions? So social insects have really mastered the ability to operate in three dimensions. So like I said, termites build these skyscraper-like structures with a lot of internal structure and the ability to self-repair. And then army ants build uh, uh, entire nests out of their own bodies. So they're just masters at self-assembly. Um, and both of them use a combination, I would say, of collective intelligence and embodied intelligence. So both how we physically manipulate the world, how we physically communicate, but then also the rules that allow a group that is so large to coordinate and create structures so much larger than themselves. Um, and some of you may be familiar with the Termes Project, uh, which was led by my student Kirsten Peterson with uh, Justin Werfel where they used ideas uh, from termites like stigmergy, how you can coordinate through the environment, but also the idea that you can build large structures if you can create structures and climb over them. So if we can make climbing robots that can climb and change structures, then you can just basically keep building staircases uh, to get higher and higher in the world. And that was the basis of the, the Termes project. But today I wanna show you a, a more new project uh, that is inspired by army ants and how army ants self-assemble. Okay, but first I wanna show you some videos of army ants because army ants are super cool. <laughs> um, so army ants constantly make temporary structures in their environment in order to solve problems in their environment. So they're nomadic, which is why they make a nest, but anytime they actually find any terrain that is rough or uh, inefficient, they form bridges across it. So here they're actually just making a shortcut because they don't like the detour. Um, and they can repair these bridges in amazing ways. The bridges adapt to traffic and you can perturb the bridges. You can like stretch them and contract them. And actually they just constantly are able to remodel. I hope this doesn't creep everyone out, but I find this really amazing to look up close at how ants are crawling all over each other uh, in the system because it starts to look like an organic tissue, this living material almost made out of collective action of these ants, so much so that you could think that they're really just acting like cells, just larger scale cells. All right, so um, biologists have been studying the self-organizing properties of these bridges for quite some time, and it's really uh, remarkable what properties uh, we've been able to learn, and my group has also been able to participate in this research and discover some of the rules uh, of self-assembly. But just to give you an idea of some of the things that army ants are able to do, 
the first thing they discovered is that the size of the bridges is proportional to the traffic. So if there's more traffic, um, there's more traffic along the trail, then the bridges actually get wider to accommodate the traffic. And in fact, if you stop the traffic or the traffic gets less, the bridge gets up and disassembles itself and leaves. <laughs> so it's like this ultimately adaptive structure. I always want all the bridges in New York area to be like this, you know, peak, peak time, they just expand to accommodate it. And then the rest of the time they shrink so that you have an unfiltered view of the river, right? Well, army ants are actually doing this. So it's not even science fiction. It's like actual science. Um, so they, they have traffic, they can repair. If you break the bridge, they will reform it. And they're just very good at creating these temporary structures. So it's adaptive to traffic, you get repair and you get temporary. And what's interesting is, of course, we don't really know the mechanisms by which ants are able to do this, but there is this hypothesis that actually a very simple local behavior might be sufficient. And it involves tactile communication. Okay, so here's the, here's the state machine that I want you to think about. So imagine that you are an ant and you're walking along um, and you're walking fine, it's great, but then people start stepping on you. Um, I guess maybe you shouldn't imagine that too deeply. <laughs> imagine that you're an ant and it doesn't bother you that people step on you. Um, okay, so, so other ants are stepping on you. And what this means is it's an indication of congestion. There's congestion around the system. So if there's congestion and somebody walks on you, then you turn into bridge state, which is that you basically stand still and you allow others to climb over you. And you stay that way as long as you're being grabbed by others in the bridge state or you're continuously being walked on. And then the second part of the state machine is that you've been in bridge state for a while and, and nobody has walked on you in a while. And so if they haven't, then you decide, okay, well, I can get up and leave and go back to the walking state. So this is the entire state machine. And it's interesting to think how this very simple local hypothesis can generate all of the behaviors I mentioned. And the key idea is that the system, or the key sort of missing idea here is that the system is self-stabilizing. So the idea is if there's a lot of congestion, a lot of individuals will go into the bridge state, but that somehow the existence of that bridge actually relieves congestion. And so now no more people are walking over others. And so the size of the bridge is proportional to the traffic. So the more traffic, the wider a bridge needed to relieve traffic. So the, the absence of congestion stabilizes the bridge. And then of course, if I, if I take away the traffic in the first place, then parts of the bridge that are on the edge, for example, can start to leave. And so you see the bridge dissolve from the edges where individuals that are not being walked on that can freely leave, leave, and then the rest of the individuals leave and then the rest of the individual leaves. Actually, like when you put one of those sugar cubes in water and it dissolves from the outside in. So think of it, think of it that way. So you're getting all of this global behavior potentially from this very simple uh, local rule. So that was sort of a very exciting thing to learn. Um, okay, so that's one, and that's really about the collective intelligence. Um, and then the second thing that um, observation that we can take away from the system is, the, is partly the embodied intelligence. And this is something that biologists actually take for granted, but maybe is more exciting to us as engineers, is that when you actually physically look at these bridges, they're not really like the bridges that we're used to. So there's no lattices, there's no trusses. Um, and lattices and trusses, of course, give you a lot of great properties. They give you strength, they give you material efficiency, they give you analytical power. But instead here, what you see is these super messy amorphous structures. And that has interesting implications too. One of the implications is that the self assembly is really fast. So individuals are not trying to precisely dock and position with each other. Rather, everybody is just kind of grabbing onto each other in this messy polymer-like structure. Um, and so it's inefficient in terms of material strength, but it's actually really efficient in terms of self-assembly because no precision is required. Um, and the second thing is that it's very compliant. So you have this polymer-like structure that is very unstructured and can maybe um, adapt just uh, being compressed or stretched. Uh, and in that way, it's fitting into a world that is itself unstructured and not built of lattices and, and so on. And so again, you have these compliance built into the system so that it can adapt to a world that is also messy. And I think this really makes sense because army ants are building temporary structures. So we build structures fast and we wanna undo the structures instead of building a structure that exists over a long time. So I think uh, for us, we would 
generally not build bridges like this. <laughs> However, there are times where we act like this too. And if you think of humans constructing out of sandbags during disaster relief, we actually build out of compliant material. We build with lots and lots of inexpert people that are not doing things in a precise way. So when we want to create temporary structures, we actually can utilize some of these principles as well. So you have these two pieces. You have the embodied intelligence of these soft structures, and then you have the collective intelligence uh, of these tactile communication. OK, so imagine that we could create our own robots uh, that could behave this way. So you have a swarm of robots that can do whatever they need to do in the environment. But if, they, uh, if there's difficult terrain, then they can self-assemble whatever is needed. They can self-assemble a bridge or a chain or a tower uh, to solve the, the problem that they need to solve. And when the task is done, they can just disassemble and move on. And that would be an amazingly, uh, that would be an amazingly powerful robot swarm to be able to have, something that can really manipulate itself and the environment the way that army ants can do. And this is the vision that inspired the uh, Eseton Robotica project in our group. Um, jokingly adding another species to the, to the army ant, uh, uh, Gidus. Um, and this was led by Melinda Malley in her PhD thesis. Um, she's now a faculty at Olin. Um, and of course, you know, my group is not the first to think about self-assembling robots. Uh, there's a lot of interest here, even at UPenn, um, from the beginning of creating robot swarms that can combine self-assembly um, with um, self-assembly with mobility. Um, but the key thing here is to move away from lattices and trusses. So could we build soft robots that can climb over each other to self-assemble without thinking about creating trusses and lattices and very mechanically rigid structures, um, but creating amorphous and compliant structures? So what would it take to create these kinds of robots um, and create that kind of embodied intelligence? And the second piece, again, inspired from the army ants is can we also create these adaptive structures? So rather than trying to create a starfish or a, a shape that you know ahead of time, actually create structures that adapt to the need in the environment the way army ants do. So maybe even just starting with bridge-like structures that army ants create. All right, so I'm gonna start by uh, showing you a video of the embodied intelligence part. Uh, so this is the, um, this is the Eseton Robotica uh, robot or the ER robot in its uh, very native and green habitat. And it moves, it's a soft robot that has a very simple motion that's nothing like an ant. So it moves by flipping. So it has a soft body, there's two cables. And when you pull one cable, it can bend one direction. You pull the other cable, it can bend the other direction. So what's happening is that the robot, you know, moves its searching foot to grab onto something and then it grabs and then it just flips again. And the really cool thing about flipping is that you can use flipping to move in many different orientations. So, and even between orientations. So you can think of the moving foot as essentially doing a search through space to grab onto something. Um, and that thing can be in any direction. And then it becomes really important to have this soft compliant body because as the foots attach, the body can take the, the configuration necessary to allow it. So that compliance in the body is really important to being able to switch between these different orientations. And um, this is still, of course, restricted to 2D. So uh, it's not steerable yet, uh, but it is completely uh, untethered. And so one of the first completely untethered soft robots uh, that could do climbing. And actually you can still see Melinda <laughs> in all of these videos. Who, who led and designed uh, this robot. Yeah, we can never get rid of her reflection in, in all of these systems. Okay, so how does the robot grab uh, the environment and how does it grab other robots? And here, Melinda was really inspired by uh, the fact that ants have microspines and tarsal hooks that allow them to grab into textured surfaces, including into the textures of each other. And so we created a gripper. Um, sorry, that went by very fast. Suddenly, let me see if I can control this a little bit better. All right. Yeah, so, the, so we designed a gripper with these cork screws that can screw into um, Velcro-like surfaces or into foam surfaces. So you wind the hooks one way, it grabs in, 
you unwind the hooks the other way, it, um, it lets go. And the, the robots themselves are covered in a, a stretchable Velcro skin. So now you can move over textured environments, but also grab into other individuals. So here you can see um, the process. And what's important here is that now the robot can grab anywhere over the other robot's body. There needs to be no sort of agreement, no docking. Um, you can just freely climb over each other. And we're still trying to make this climbing uh, more reliable and our ability to climb over like many different robots. Um, but the key is that um, the, the gripper itself is actually really strong in both tension and peel. And so we can actually create structures by hand in many different configurations, getting closer to the, to the chains and towers. All right, so the last piece is that ants detect the ability of other ants to walk over them. So in our case, we decided to implement that kind of tactile um, communication through vibration. So the robot vibrates as it moves, but it can also sense other robots vibrating over it. So here you see our sort of first and only experiments with, with two fully untethered robots running the full program. And so the top robot is you know, going along and then it'll step on the bottom robot. And as soon as it does, it creates, it's creating vibration pulses anyways, but the bottom robot now knows that it's being walked on. So it turns into bridge state and it stays stationary. And now the other robot can walk over it and continue its path. Um, and then the bridge robot decides that no one's walking over it. So it actually just escapes. <laughs> uh, and that is the end of the experiment. Um, but it's really, we're still sort of playing around with different configurations, turning this into 3D. But the, the promise of soft robotics really is this ability to deal with more complex situations. And it's really interesting how many errors the system can actually recover from, including escaping <laughs> from our, our uh, arenas pretty often or, or falling down and, and recovering. And I think we're still learning how to make these systems more robust. Okay, so these are two robots, um, but we can simulate what would happen if we had hundreds of robots running that simple algorithm. So I just show you a simulation of those ideas. So we created a, an abstract simulator that's thinking about flipping robots that are sort of rigid two feet robots, but they connect to each other with compliant joints. So in this way, we don't have to simulate all of the soft aspects of the system. And we're simulating a variation of the very same um, walking state, bridge state that I explained to you. Um, and we see that we can reproduce actually the behaviors that the biologists believe. So in fact, in this sort of V setting, which is what they tested, if you have low traffic, you get very tiny bridges. If you have a lot of traffic, you get much larger bridges and the bridges do seem to stabilize over time. And so we still, still can't prove how this system is happening, but we actually have pretty much the same phase space as the other one, uh, as they described. And of course, if you cut off the traffic, then you can actually start to see the disassembly process. All is really fun to watch. It's not, a, not the dynamics is not what I'm expecting, um, but you can see that sometimes you have trapped individuals and other individuals move, but you basically are able to have both the traffic and adaptiveness as well as the ability to disassemble. All right, and these guys take a little longer, okay. But even more importantly, we can create other structures with the same uh, kind of uh, the same algorithm. So here, uh, instead of the V-shaped terrain, is really just creating ramps. So anytime there's a complex environment and there's congestion, you create these structures and you uh, unform these structures. And recently, Melinda and her student have shown that you can extend this even to thinking about uh, structures that are not purely defined by congestion but defined by the ability and ability to reach. So army ants form towers and chains. And what she showed is a very simple variation of this rule will actually allow individuals to create cantilevers um, that can connect different structures. So now we're really getting close to being able to create all of the different kinds of structures that army ants create, but from an algorithm that fundamentally depends on tactile communication and on this notion that congestion is a signal to create, to create structure because structure helps relieve congestion. All right, so of course uh, we're still, you know, just scratching the surface of what's possible. This is one possible mechanical design. It doesn't look like ants at all, um, but we can start to think about different self-assembly and different kinds of mechanical structures. And I think for me, what's most exciting about working, thinking about army ants or thinking about um, termites 
is that these are social insects that manipulate their physical environment in very specific ways. And as we try to impl implement or copy these ideas, we both understand more about the biology, but also get closer to making robots that are more in tune and, and adaptive to their physical environment. See how I'm doing on, on time. Okay. Um, and I just wanted to end with uh, some, some fun videos from a recent piece of work that's going on in my group. So of course, self-assembling robots are, are still very much science fiction, but climbing robots have a lot of applications. And so one potential application is in inspection. So can we have multiple climbing robots moving over structures and inspecting them? And so we're now a uh, part of this project with my collaborator, uh, Ariel Ekblaw, who's the director of the Space Exploration Initiative. And we got to test this idea of having different kinds of robots. So, so soft climbing inchworm-like robots or flipping robots alongside wheeled robots, heterogeneous swarms uh, moving over metal structures for inspection. And all of this, as you can see from the masks, were uh, great things that we were able to do during the pandemic. And I'm continuing this work now at, uh, at Princeton, where we're looking at uh, robot swarms that are moving over multiple, moving over large scale structures. And you could think of this as like ants in trees, arboreal ants in trees. What kinds of things can we do if we could create swarms of climbing robots that can climb over structures? What does it mean to take the algorithms that we understand for? for ground robots and take them into this new environment. So this is an area um, that I'm really excited about that we're just, just starting out with. All right, so the, the last um, collective that I wanted to show to you is one uh, that does more than just create shape. It actually creates shape in motion, uh, and that is fish schools. And fish schools are, are of course, you know, something that maybe most of us have observed. If, if not on TV, hopefully many of you have snorkeled. I love to snorkel. Um, I'm a very bad swimmer, so snorkeling is, is about as close as I can get. But you see that fish schools create dynamic structures. Not only do they migrate over long distances, but they evade predators, they create bait balls, and all of these complex structures are believed to emerge through, through purely local rules. Um, so for the robotics side, we've made a tremendous amount of progress in aerial vehicles and our ability to create aerial swarms, especially things like the crazy, crazy flyers are now in every, every lab imaginable. Um, but when we look at underwater robots, we're not able to replicate that same level of um, progress that we've seen in aerial swarms. And one of it is that the underwater environment is just very challenging. So while in the um, aerial environment, we can take advantage of GPS and wireless communications, when you go underwater, you lose all of that infrastructure. So people have been pursuing many different approaches to dealing with that problem. One option is that you have underwater robots that only communicate on the surface. So we use GPS and wireless on the surface, and then we're sort of blind underwater. Um, another option is to use acoustic technology and try to recreate localization and communication underwater. So that's a big area. And then there are also groups that are trying to create heterogeneous swarms where we combine multiple versions of these methods to provide lots of different communication possibilities underwater. But when we look at fish schools, um, communication and, lo and global localization is not the dominant method that fish use. Instead, fish are primarily relying on something called implicit coordination, which is that you observe other individuals and you react to them. And that all of your behaviors are through observations and local observations of individuals in your swarm. And there's lots of studies uh, from biology and just theoretical studies showing that you can actually do, potentially do a lot of collective and coordinated behavior just with implicit coordination. So without global localization and without, um, wireless or direct communication. So can we use this to create underwater robots? And I think that that sort of gives us also this question of collective intelligence and embodied intelligence. So we can use the literature of uh, implicit coordination to start to build these systems, but we also have to create a robot that's capable of observing its neighbors in 3D and reacting. So if, you, if the idea is to observe and react, how do you do 3D perception and how do you do 3D maneuverability? And if we can achieve both of those in a swarm, then we can start to really practice with implicit coordination. And this is the motivation behind a, a relatively new project in my group called Blue Swarm, 
uh, where we're building a test bed of underwater robots that, can, that are capable of doing 3D implicit coordination as a test bed for really testing the, the power and limitations of implicit coordination. And this project has been led by um, my recently graduated PhD student, Florian Berlinger. Um, and so I'll show you a, a video of these robots. So the robots are relatively small. They're 13 centimeters um, in length and they have multiple fins. And so in order to have multiple fins, we use these uh, actuators called magnet and coil actuators. They're really cool. There's just magnetic coils that you can flip. Again, I, this video, sorry, it goes a little too fast. Um, magnetic coil actuators that you can flip. And with that, we can create these fins uh, that are very small and can be submerged in water um, without any problems. And so this allows us to create a robot that can move forward, move up and down and, and turn independently uh, in all three independent ways and move at about one body length per second. So now we can really react to things in our neighborhood and have this sort of 3D movement with a very simple dynamics that those of us who are not used to complex dynamics can deal with, <laughs> which is you know, drive and turn. Uh, very, very simple things. Okay, and then for vision, we have uh, two cameras with, ironically, fisheye lens. And so this fisheye lens allows this uh, small robot to actually have an incredible 360 view of its world with a very small blind spot in the back. So now we have sort of this 360 ability to see our neighbors uh, in three dimensions. And, you know, considering that it's hard even for a test bed, to control things underwater, we really have to make everything um, local. So it, every robot is making its own local decisions about its neighborhood and implementing it. And in this way, we really have to practice with implicit coordination. All right, let me start this again. All right, so our vision systems are still fairly simple. Uh, eventually, we'd like to have robots with patterns like you see in, in real fish. But here for now, we have three LEDs uh, on the robots. If you use two LEDs, you can look at distance. And if you have three, uh, you, can, you can actually look at heading. But from the robot's perspective, once there's robots in a crowd, this was actually um, from the robot's point of view. Um, so from the robot's point of view, in a crowd though, what it really sees is a pattern of dots. And so now we have to translate from this pattern of dots into uh, a notion of neighborhood, a notion of how many individuals are they, where are they heading, how far are they? And of course there's error and occlusion and all of these other aspects of perception that come into play. And so this is just an example where we're looking at something simple like the Leonard Jones aggregation and dispersion. And you can see on the left that the robots are moving between aggregation and dispersion. And on the right, what they see is this sort of moving pattern of dots. But even with that sort of error, error-prone um, perception, we're actually able to now start to investigate many different kinds of self-organized and collective behaviors that are sort of classic behaviors uh, based on 3D perception and 3D motion. All right, so what are the things that you can do with implicit coordination? So a classic example of implicit coordination is, is flocking. And in, in the late 1980s, there was a really popular paper by Craig Reynolds uh, called The Boyds, um, where he showed that you could simulate a flock of birds or a school of fish, uh, where each agent in that system was looking only at its local neighborhood, uh, at the headings and the, and the distances of a small local neighborhood. And it used essentially three rules. So I wanna align with my neighbors, uh, I don't want to get too close to them, so I want some spacing, and that has repulsion, but there's also cohesion. I like to be close to my neighbors as well. And so just with the combination of these three rules, and even with just local behavior, you could create or simulate these amazingly realistic looking um, flocks and birds. And in fact, his rules were actually completely based on decades of research that had been done with fish. So he was not sort of making up the rules out of nowhere. He actually read a whole bunch of literature uh, on flocking and just collapsed it into these very, very simple rules. So flocking has been an area that people have studied a lot. Um, and there's just tons and tons of papers on flocking. But fish do more than just flock. They actually create really interesting dynamic structures. So they create these circular milling structures or bait balls 
to demonstrate strength or you know, basically repel predators. Um, and they also create these really complex maneuvers or complex looking maneuvers to evade predators, to confuse predators, um, and to, and to um, yeah, I guess to confuse predators so that basically they can survive even larger animals that are, are much faster than them. And so how do we go from flocking to looking at other kinds of behaviors that are happening from, uh, from implicit coordination? So I'll just show you some examples of, of implementing and looking at these uh, other kinds of implicit coordination behaviors. All right, so I'll start with milling. So milling um, can be thought of as a flocking state. You're basically flocking in a circle. So you're just sort of moving around yourself. And many people who study flocking have shown that if you set the parameters for alignment, repulsion, cohesion correctly, you can actually create flocking as a, as a state in the parameter space of flocking. So if you think of the three weights that you get to set, there's actually weights that will allow you to create this state. But this still assumes that in order to create these structures, you have to know your, all of your neighbors' uh, headings and directions. And even locally, we might have lots of errors in that system. So recently, a group um, from Sheffield showed that, in fact, you don't need all of that information. They were really interested in minimalist local rules. And they showed that, actually, you could create milling with a binary sensor. And so the idea is that each agent in the system, they were really looking at ground robots. Each agent in the system only cares about the robots in front of it. And uh, if there's a robot in front of it, then it tends to move to the left away from the robot. And if there's no robot in front of it, it moves to the right. And so in this picture, you can think of the blue robot as basically, um, sorry, the robot with the blue visor sees a robot in its front. And as a result, it tries to make an adjustment, whereas the other robots are actually pretty happy where they are. They don't see other robots um, and they get a state in this system. And what's interesting is that we can prove that this rule actually has a, a fixed state. And the fixed state is for the group uh, to be in a circle. So here you can see a simulation of this idea. Um, we start out with all of them clustered together, and then they, uh, the circle emerges from the system. And this is, in fact, a stable state. So a circle with equispaced agents is the, is the stable state. Once they're in it, they won't leave. Um, and if they're not, then we can't. We still can't prove convergence, but you know, if simulation results are, are accurate, then it really actually converges pretty quickly. And the, the really interesting thing is that the size of the circle is proportional to the number of agents in this system. So that's never programmed into the system at all. It always emerges as a result of the, of the outcome. So it's, we're starting to look more at this idea that maybe there are, we don't actually know what fish are paying attention to. We actually do know that fish don't pay attention to all of their neighbors, but we don't know how they select. So I think we still have this idea that we can look at simpler, more minimalist algorithms that are actually really, really robust. So this uh, minimalist algorithm is actually pretty fun to watch on the, on the blue bots. Here, our biggest problem actually is tank size, uh, that the robots bump into the walls of the tank, which basically perturbs the circle. But every time the circle still sort of starts to reemerge. So here you can see um, they're moving together. They're actually at different depths. So the next view, I think we'll show it from the side. Here you can see again, there's some collisions and then it goes back into the state. And here you can look at it from the side. So we have them at different depths. So we're creating essentially a cylindrical structure. Um, all right. Um, and these are, uh, so in the tank that we, ha we had, um, we could basically log their trajectories. So here you can see the three-dimensional trajectories as they basically go through, go through these circles. So it's not perfect circles, of course, but um, it's actually incredibly robust. So here you can see them forming a circle and then you'll see Florian come in with his bucket of fish <laughs> uh, and add some fish to the system and the circle actually automatically gets bigger and then he can take them out and the circle automatically adjusts to be smaller. And of course, this adjustment is not something that the robots are doing explicitly. It's something that implicitly falls out uh, of, the, of the algorithm. All right, so um, we're excited in Princeton to have this really large tank. So I hope that we can do these kinds of experiments and maybe even think about spherical um, things, but even more generally looking at these kinds of minimalist algorithms, they're, they're very robust and, and a really exciting direction, I think, to, to move in versus just 
making everything off of blocking. OK, so the second one that I wanted to show you is called the fountain maneuver. Um, am I like basically running out of time? <laughs> OK, all right, then I'll just show the about this is the sort of the last piece that I was going to show anyways. All right, so um, in the fountain maneuver, what happens is a predator comes and you have a line group and they basically create this fountain uh, away from the predator and then magically reassemble behind the predator. I, I imagine that the predator must be so annoyed. <laughs> right? it's, like, it's like, I really, you're gonna all line up behind me? Um, and yet they do this very predictably and the predator comes back and back again, as you saw in the video and it still works. And it's actually really remarkable, but um, there is a study if, from the late 80s that showed that this really complex seeming formation might actually be a result of something very simple, which is that the fish wants to keep the predator behind it. So wherever I am, I look at the direction of the predator and I move my angle so that the predator is at the edge of my blind spot. So they're using their blind spot to be as far behind you, but not totally behind you. And so if you look at the picture on the right, you can see that in different positions that would determine your heading and your heading actually looks like a fountain away. So in fact, even as each agent is sort of doing their own thing, the fact that they start from an aligned state and the predator has a sort of predictable type of trajectory, which is to move very quickly through the group, you can create these fountain-like behaviors. So this is a, a simulation of this, but basically you have two behaviors. You have escape, which is moving away from the predator in this fountain one. And then you have alignment, which is as soon as the predator is far away from you, you go back to your typical desire to align. And so you can get that behavior where the predator moves through and you basically reassemble behind the predator. All right. So we were able to implement this also um, with, the, with the blue bots. So here you can see the blue bots align. The predator is actually just a red light on a stick, <laughs> which is kind of funny. But I, I will say like all of these experiments were done uh, during the pandemic. So uh, I hope we will be able to do these in even more sort of interesting ways. Uh, but, but this was our first time also being able to look at alignment. So our ability to have these individual robots start from random states and align into aligned state as they would if they were flocking. But they stay stationary because we don't have a large enough tank to have them moving. And then the escape protocol, which is to basically look at um, the predator and change your position based on that. So here you'll see the predator move through. And these are sort of the trajectories that were on a previous slide. So you can see them move around. So we can track and look at the trajectories uh, and see how close we are able to, to model the, the theory. And eventually it would be really interesting to have, for example, two types of robots. Um, so here's our first examples of doing this in a, in a larger tank at Olin. Um, there's other complexities with trying to have much larger tanks and tiny robots. Um, but maybe eventually we could look at even more complex predator prey dynamics by having two types of blue swarm robots, the red, the red robots and the blue robots, um, and think about the dynamics between heterogeneous swarms. All right, we're also uh, looking at hydrodynamics work. Um, which is again, taking implicit uh, coordination even further, which is the, what are the energetic benefits, for example, that we can derive from these systems. And one of the nice things about the blue bots is that we can now sort of try to do these formations in flow channels and potentially look at PIV. Um, so I will just show you actually the, the last piece of this, which is that we've started to look at different kinds of fin structures and be able to look at the vortices that are created uh, by its similar robots underwater. So now imagine having multiple robots doing this. And that'll be really exciting. I think it'll be the first time uh, to have fully autonomous untethered robots and look at the, at the schooling interactions. So this is really something we're just starting uh, in the lab. All right, um, I picked this just because we're still very far uh, from being able to take these underwater. You can kind of see Florian here, uh, and this is Walden Pond. Uh, but eventually, I think the computer vision part of this is also just a really exciting. We're still looking at just blue lights, but now imagine a group of robots using computer vision, moving through visually rich environments like a coral reef. And I think we're starting to get closer and closer to be able, be able to create those kind of swarms 
that might even fit into the natural environment that they're in. But I think a lot of that work involves uh, much of the embodied intelligence part of it still. All right, so I've shown you a couple of projects and I just wanted to end by saying that, uh, what is it that thousands of individuals can do together? And so science being one of them. So all of the work that I have presented is itself the result of collective intelligence. Um, so I get to work with these really amazing people who you saw in the video, as well as uh, some terrific collaborators. And because I think of the diversity of the group in terms of their backgrounds and their creativity and the kinds of things that inspire them and the tools that they bring to the table, we have truly achieved uh, more than the sum of our parts. Uh, and as some of you know, um, I've just joined Princeton um, and we're really building up the robotics group here. We have many new faculty, some of whom like Christine Allen Blanchett, you may recognize uh, as one of your own. Um, and yeah, I hope that the people from here will visit and, and you'll consider us in your future. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I went, I went slower than I had thought. No, that's great. Um, I'm going to introduce our student panelists. So we have Tori Edwards and Jessica Weekly, and I'm gonna pass the mic off to you guys. Um, if you are on Zoom, if you are on Zoom joining us, please submit your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. These will be answered during the Q&A panel at the end of the talk, which is right now. If you are here in person, we would love to take your questions live and we will walk around and pass the microphone. Thank you for such an amazing talk. Um, so I have a rather philosophical question. So how do you validate if you're learning the actual local rules in the animals or insects? So we can be assured that we're learning the macro behaviors or the emergent behaviors in a similar fashion, but uh, you know, the rules that govern these behaviors may not be unique. So it, even if we're able to replicate it, it doesn't mean that's the actual thing that the animals are doing. So, right. yeah. Yeah, and I think that the, the motivation does matter a lot when you're trying to tackle these research. So I would say like in most of the cases, we're not actually trying to replicate the biological behavior. We're trying to utilize what biologists think is going on to achieve our own purpose. So for example, I want kilobots to form a wrench which is not something that is formed in biology, but I want them to form an arbitrary shape. And that's not a motivation with which biologists look at cells. Or in the Termes project, or even the, the army ants project, we want robots that can achieve certain properties, but we may not care whether or not what biologists told us is correct, right? If it works for us. So that's one motivation. Um, for the other motivation, my group does work directly with biologists. And in that case, the only way to, you can never prove that. The, so first of all, you can never prove that some particular rule is what an emergent behavior is doing. You're just creating more and more evidence through your experiments. And so in that case, we're often relying on modeling or vision or trajectory tracking. We're sort of bringing our tools as engineers to the table, but then the motivation really is only to probe uh, the systems or to use models to argue that something is general, if that makes sense. But I usually try to keep those two separate because otherwise it's very confusing philosophically, like what, what are you trying to do? Um, internally, I'm motivated by both, but externally, I think it is important, you know, during that process of experimentation to really keep in mind which, which direction you're going for. But that's a great question. Thanks. Uh, thank you for that really fascinating talk. Um... I think you showed some really great examples of what uh, we can all agree are uh, instances of collective intelligence. Um, and uh, it, it got me to start thinking about, can we somehow mathematically characterize, and people have perhaps already been thinking about this, what it means for collective intelligence to emerge, how much of it we have in a system. Um, can we say that we have more of it in this instance versus the other instance, things like this. Yeah, no, that's a really interesting question. I think people have tried a few different methods. So one method might be to compare the state of an individual. So how many, if I could think of my system as a discrete system, so how many states do I have? And then compare that with the range of the pattern that I'm able to create. And so that's, that's a sense of emergence is how, how restricted is my state and my view? 
And what is the scale of the pattern itself? Is it much larger than me? So that might be one way to characterize it. I don't know if it's the most useful, but it is, it is one technique. Um, people use entropy and other mechanisms also to characterize like how much order is in the system. So you might always have the same state, but one rule might be more self-organizing than another because it creates a different kind of, it creates you know, more or less entropy in the system. And so I think that's been one of the biggest ways to characterize it is um, to, do it, to do it that way. Nancy Lynch's group, another method that they've used is to think about scalability. So they would argue that uh, a system is self-organizing if I can just continually increase the number of agents in the process. So I'm always acting on my three nearest neighbors, but actually this works for a thousand or a hundred or 10 that there's no other scale in the system that I'm encoding into my internal state. And that's also an interesting way of looking at the global versus the, versus the local. But they're, of course, coming from a distributed algorithms point of view. So they're thinking that one method is more scalable than the other method. So it has real implications for, for implementation. Um, I think the entropy way of thinking is more coming from the physics uh, way of looking at patterns. But you know, so many of these patterns also emerge in inanimate systems. And so I think you know, even the concept that there is intelligence or a rule is kind of questionable in some cases, right? Because it might actually just be a mechanism um, that is at, at play. So yeah, I, I'm still sort of looking at those and I'm not sure, sure how I feel. Uh, in my case, I just feel like, oh, we made a robot and it worked <laughs> sometimes, so yeah. Hi, Erotica. We're here. Hey. Um, I actually have a question uh, in regards to the introduction of greedy agents into collective intelligence. Um, I, I can constantly think in all of the army and most of the examples that you gave that any agent might be a little more ambitious to achieve whatever goal that you have set for them um, and how that can impact the collective. Maybe not so much if you have one greedy agent. But as that number um, grows, can you comment a little bit on how that's impacting collective? Yeah, I, I mean, I think most of the systems that I look at have an assumption of cooperativity in them. So if you look at uh, if you look at cells and ants, for example, most of them ants are very clonally related. So people think of them as like the cells in your body, that the cells in your body are not generally greedy. <laughs> um, they are there is a cooperative way in which the survival of the organism is so much more important than the survival of a cell that a cell would never consider itself more important than the organism. But when you get to fish, that's not true. So there's a lot of questions about, you know, if you were, if you were part of a fish school, being inside seems way better than being on the outside for lots of reasons, for drag, uh, for protection, for they think that inside is like, you save energy and you have less turbulence and all of this. So you would argue that the system should constantly be collapsing on itself. And yet that's not what they observe. So I feel like in these systems, we don't even, when I look at sort of the biology of the systems, it's not understood how greedy behavior emerges or how it's tolerated in these systems. They mostly look at, um, lack of information. So you may make a bad decision or do something bad for the group without intentionally doing it just because you have limited information. Um, it's like when you know everybody hits the brakes and then you have additional collisions because of all of the brake hitting, which wasn't necessary. Um, but you were acting you know, not selfishly, you were just reacting to the panic that was happening. So I think that most of the has been around that structure. Um, so I don't, I don't have good, a good answer to that. Um, the other thing is there are other examples like supply and demand or other sort of collective behaviors where everybody approaches it through self-interest and the outcome is good rather than bad. And so I think that has been looked at as well as a mechanism. So if I look at systems where everybody can come in as a self-interested agent, but because of the mechanism design or because of the overall design, I'm guaranteed that the equilibrium is good for the group. Um, then those are things that we could look at as well. Otherwise I would say like all of my systems are super susceptible. Um, so if you had any sort of bad adversarial agents, our algorithms are actually not at all good at protecting against that. 
Um, so, so that's an area I would say, like, it is a pretty big area that's missing from my research, but, but is investigated by other groups. Also, thank you for your thoughtful You don't have to say that. <laughs> All right. There's a question in the Zoom chat from Tua Wong who asks about the bridge forming project and wants to know how does the individual unit, the ant or the robot, learn from the continually involving global structure so that they can prevent the bridge or general structures from local mechanical failures? So, I mean, in this system and with the army ants, you could argue that there are constantly failures. So even as the bridges are forming and we're perturbing them, Lots of things go wrong. Ants get dislodged out of it. Ants get stuck in it that don't want to be stuck. Um, and so I think that the system is not as sensitive to failures because you're over-provisioning it with materials. And so the absence of an individual or addition is not. I don't know if it was visible in the, in the image that I showed, but as we would stretch the bridges, sometimes the bridges break. And it's actually quite interesting to see you, you break the system. So now you have a bunch of ants here and a bunch of ants here. And instead of doing something very smart, they just all run over the cliff. <laughs> and so there's like this waterfall of like stuff. And so all these ants are like dripping and falling off of, off of the, the cliff. And then something hits together and there's a bridge that forms. And then actually these, you know, hanging off ants actually disassemble and leave. It's actually pretty remarkable to see, but like that's not the kind of recovery from mechanical failure that I would have, you know, imagined. But I, I think these, these macro level recoveries uh, can allow individual failures to happen at a very high rate. And so we can have individuals fall off the bridge because there's millions of them and we don't, we don't care. So I, I don't, I think until we can mass produce robots, we can't really play that kind of game. Um, but I think in these colonies, that's the primary method is that by having so many individuals, you can have macro systems for self recovery, but you're not caring about the individual molecules or individual cells uh, being lost in the process at all. Um, maybe I'll ask my own question. I'm curious what you think are the, kind of the primary limitation or the main challenge that prevents us from seeing these forms, um, yeah, in robots, yeah. I mean, it's still hard to build and manage a single robot, which I think all of us in robotics are very familiar with. <laughs> in fact, I'm happy, I always have trouble with projectors, so I'm not sure that we're doing good. We put projectors everywhere and they're causing us grief everywhere. Um, so I, I, I do think that, you know, when we look at natural systems, so much of the self-maintenance is built into the systems. And we're not quite at the stage where we build self-maintaining robots that repair themselves or manage themselves or eat by themselves and so on. And so I think there's this whole sort of piece, not just the manufacturing that we have to mass manufacture them because I think we're actually good at mass manufacturing things. It's just that after we mass manufacture them, then we attach them to a human being and then the human being does all of the repair. Right, so it's like I give you your phone, when it crashes, you do the updates, blah, blah, blah. Everything that goes wrong, you're going to fix. But if we want to get to this stage, then that can't be that a robot is attached to an individual. And so I think we can manufacture, but making sort of self-managing systems. That's why I'm really excited actually about the NASA project because their goal is to make self-managing space stations, uncrewed systems, that are persisting over a long time. And actually that's still not done except for satellites. Um, there's just this constant ISS constantly has to have a human on board managing and debugging the system. So what would it take to have these space structures that could live and manage on their own? What would it mean to have robot swarms in that space that basically maintained the structure? And so I think in that setting where it's like a very specific task, we might be able to think about how to create a swarm that lives for a long time that doesn't require all of this extra management that we're currently doing, babysitting each of our individual robots. So let's thank our speaker one more time. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. Please tune in next Friday, November 18th at 10.30 Eastern Standard Time for our next Grasp on Robotics talk featuring Dr. Julie Adams from Oregon State University. 
For more information on upcoming events, be sure to follow us on social media or check out our website. Thank you again and have a wonderful day.